We all need a break from the constant cycle to learn something new, to gain new perspectives. The Great Courses Plus streaming service is an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects or pick up a new hobby. I've been enjoying The Great Courses Plus while researching this season of Flashback. Lectures like Play Ball, The Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime, History of the Supreme Court, and Battlefield Europe have helped me connect the dots on several stories from history. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. Welcome to Flashback, a podcast about history's unintended consequences. I'm Sean Braswell. In today's episode, a tale of twin invasions, one by vine and one by caterpillar. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 1876. Welcome to the first World's Fair to be held in the United States. It's called the Centennial International Exhibition, and it's a celebration of America's 100th birthday. And it is one hell of a history-making affair. Its exhibits read like a who's who of American inventions. Alexander Graham Bell's first telephone. Thomas Edison's automatic telegraph. Henry J. Hines's catch-up. The first typewriter. Nearly 10 million visitors will attend the exposition. But two lesser-known exhibits were also present at the fair, ones that are at the center of today's episode. For the first, we enter into the Japanese pavilion. When the World's Fair came to the United States, there was an effort to build relationships between uh, Japan and the United States. This is Bill Finch, a historian, horticulturalist, and a conservation advisor for the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. A classic Japanese vine was on display inside that pavilion, one hailed as the ideal shading plant for porches or courtyards. It didn't really catch on. It was just a sort of a, another one of many plants from Japan, like azaleas and camellias and other things, uh, tea plants that uh, that they thought might be of interest to Americans. The vine was kudzu. And while it wasn't a hit at the 1876 World's Fair, kudzu is now perhaps America's most infamous weed, the poster child for an invasive species. We'll get back to that. If you walked around the World's Fair long enough, you would also come across something else, some stunning pencil and pastel drawings, gorgeous pictures of planets, stars, nebulas, the Northern Lights, they were the work of an eccentric French artist and astronomer named Etienne Leopold Trouvelot. Thanks to Trouvelot, another species, every bit as invasive as kudzu, would begin its own assault on the United States, the gypsy moth. First, though, we turn to that pesky invasive vine, kudzu. So this is a funny story. Uh, we, we moved to Florida 10 years ago from New York City. This is Dr. Susanna Valente. And one day my husband woke up and said, he was an architect, and he says, oh, today, no, I'm going to be a farmer from now on. <laughs> and it was a quite of a uh, change. And so we bought this land, and uh, it's in a very nice area of Florida, in the area of uh, West Palm Beach, and he wants to grow an organic farm. And so we have animals, we have cows, chickens, turkeys, geese, uh, ducks. Valente and her husband found that running a farm can be a challenging endeavor. And so uh, one day we had a, um, an infection in the turkeys. It was a respiratory infection in turkeys. Valente and her husband wanted to find a natural cure for the ailment, and they came up with oregano oil. So we used it actually in the water, in the turkeys, and in, within two weeks we cleared the infections in the animals. And we got interested in these natural products, and we were reading about a lot of things, and we, we tumbled upon kudzu as well. Kudzu was not just in the books that Valente and her husband read. It was all over their farm. Pretty much everywhere. It covers up a lot of the trees around here, but I actually think it's a pretty thing. And she soon learned that the invasive vine was more than just pretty. 
So kudzu had this very interesting anti-inflammatory, anti-microbial properties as well. So uh, we started got interested in it. And one day my husband said, hey, why don't you look into HIV as well? Valente's husband wasn't worried about the turkeys getting HIV. You see, his wife, Susanna, is not just an organic farmer. She's an immunologist at the Scripps Research Institute, one of several trying to find new ways to combat HIV. And so, thanks to her husband's suggestion, Valente started to investigate kudzu. Each spring and summer across the American South, you hear a lot of stories like this one from Channel 13, WMAZ News in Macon, Georgia. Right over here is where it gets the most out of hand. Ginger Hudson has overcome a lot of battles. She lost her first husband and survived breast cancer, but now she's at war with kudzu. It's just choking everything out, it's covering them. You can't see anything. Like there, there was a tree underneath that big bush right there, but it's no longer there because the uh, kudzu's killing it. Sometimes called the vine that ate the South, kudzu now blankets large portions of the southeastern U.S. If you grew up in the South like I did and spent any amount of time driving on the highways, it felt like kudzu was everywhere. Kudzu is a trailing and climbing semi-woody vine. It can get um, woody stems up to, you know, thick as your arm, sometimes even up to 10 inches or so in diameter. Nancy Lowenstein is the executive director of the Alabama Invasive Plant Council. The leaves are trifoliate, so there's three leaflets. Um, the flowers are lavender to purple colored with a yellow center, and the flowers smell like grapes. So sometimes when you're walking around in the summertime and just in the middle of nowhere and you smell what kind of smells like grape Kool-Aid or grape bubblegum, start looking around and you're likely to find some kudzu flowers in the area. And where does the vine grow best? Might be easier to say where it does not grow well. And that is, it does not grow well in really wet areas or very high pH soils. It does also doesn't do well in the shade. So you don't see it too often in dense forests. You see it more often in open areas. And kudzu has already started to eat parts of America beyond the south. Well, it's already spread all the way up into um, southern New England. It's up into Illinois, Indiana, western, west into Missouri and Arkansas. It's even pushing into Kansas and Oklahoma, Texas. And then there's a few disjunct populations over in Oregon and Arizona. It's estimated that kudzu costs up to half a billion dollars in lost cropland and control costs each year. So how did the invasive plant go from being a World's Fair novelty to a catastrophic nuisance? In the years after the World's Fair, if you found kudzu in the U.S., it was usually for ornamental purposes. Bill Finch again. So if you were in New England uh, in the 19th century and you had a bit of money and you were a bit of a horticultural experimenter, somebody who liked to try new plants in the garden, you might have tried using kudzu as an ornamental vine, and a few people did. It was pleasant, kind of like wisteria, but not as nice. And it might have stayed that way if weather and the U.S. government hadn't intervened. And the Dust Bowl transformed the way people saw the American landscape. It, it struck the fear of God into people everywhere. During the early 1930s, a severe drought over the American plains caused winds and choking dust to sweep the region from the south up to Nebraska. Farmers were having a real struggle. They were moving all over the place trying to find some new land that worked. Georgia's fields had been farmed so hard. The Carolinas had been farmed so hard. Alabama was just being whipped <laughs> again and again. People were desperate. <laughs> They were looking for solutions anywhere. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a good one when he became president in 1933. When Roosevelt came into office, one of his big campaigns was to, was to overcome the problems of the Dust Bowl uh, and the barrenness of the Dust Bowl, to stop erosion at all costs. Roosevelt and Congress created a new organization, the Civilian Conservation Corps, Five days after the law was signed, 25,000 men signed up to work for the CCC. Young John Citizen, who arrived at camp flabby of arm and cocky of mind, is now tough as a hickory nut. The CCC eventually employed more than 3 million. It was Roosevelt's most popular New Deal program. 
I wish that I could take a couple of months off from the White House and come down here and live with them, because I know I'd get full of health the way they have. The CCC started a massive plan to stabilize American soil, and they had a secret weapon, a plant they called the Miracle Vine, because of its ability to flourish in difficult environments and to grow rapidly. Kudzu. Some of their folks realized, well, it's, you know, it is a great fodder. It can cover ground fairly well once it gets established. And so the U.S. government started producing millions, literally millions, of starts of kudzu. More than 70 million kudzu seedlings were grown in government-run nurseries. Farmers were paid as much as $8 per acre to plant the vine. But it wasn't just the Dust Bowl where kudzu came in handy. Railroads and highways were being built all across the United States at the time. And the railroads and the highway builders were creating their own kind of barren landscapes as they built these railroads and highways through the middle of the woods. There was no vegetation covering the causeways and the the embankments that they were creating along these highways, and they needed something to cover it quickly. And so they planted kudzu all along the highways and railways, especially in the south. And kudzu finally... finally came into its own along those highways and railroads because there were no cows to eat it. There were no horses to eat it. So once you planted it, it continued growing and grew and grew and grew. And alongside that growth, something else sprouted, a legend. So many of the South highways and so many of the railroads were planted in kudzu. And uh, that had a really interesting effect because suddenly, People's view of the southern landscape was what they saw out their car windows. It seemed like kudzu was everywhere. And that's when the myth-making began. Kudzu really did grab hold of the popular imagination. But by the 1940s and 1950s and 60s, a new generation of southern writers, they actually began writing about kudzu. James Dickey, um, who uh, wrote the novel Deliverance, had a very famous poem about kudzu. Yes, that deliverance. Seven years before he wrote Deliverance, Dickey published a poem in The New Yorker called Kudzu. It reads like a southern version of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. In Georgia, the legend says that you must close your windows at night to keep it out of the house. The glass is tinged with green Even so, as the tendrils crawl over the fields, the night the kudzu has your pasture, you sleep like the dead. And it's clearly meant to be outrageous, but people took it seriously. It was about kudzu covering houses and and, uh, kudzu invading people's lives. And it sort of caught the essence of, 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 of how people feared kudzu and what it was going to do to the landscape. James Dickey called kudzu, quote, a vegetal form of cancer. Some of his invaded Southern compatriots, on the other hand, they began to identify with their captor. And eventually, Southerners adopted kudzu as kind of a pet idea. They would come up with ideas for, well, let's name our restaurant after kudzu. Let's name, uh, let's name our our website after kudzu. There are, there are, businesses all across the South, named for kudzu because of this outgrowth of popularity. In some ways, the mythic reach of kudzu became more important to the South than the vine itself. It was far more part of our social culture. It was far more part of our speech and our language than it was part of the landscape. But while the mythic version of kudzu has indeed swallowed the South, the actual vine's grip is far more tenuous and more complicated. Do you have an interesting tale about unintended consequences from history or your own life? Please share it with us by emailing flashback at ozzy.com. That's flashback at ozy.com.
We'll return in a moment to kudzu and our tale of vegetal cancer. But first I want to tell you about another invasive species deflowering America, one that is also tied to the 1876 World's Fair. Seem to be everywhere, moths taking over backyards and front doors. The problem's so bad that a swarm of moths actually delayed a JetBlue flight yesterday. So why are we... That's right. So a few years ago, a flight at Logan International Airport in Boston was delayed for more than 20 minutes for an unusual reason, a swarm of gypsy moths. The problem went well beyond the airport. They're kind of like really nasty and gross. Never seen as many moths as I've seen in the last couple of days. Moths. A plague of gypsy moths already afflicts many parts of the northeastern U.S. during the summer months. And it's only going to get worse as they continue to spread to new places and in greater numbers. So why this moth invasion? Well, the head of the state's forestry health program blames several years of unusually dry weather. That's true about the dry weather. But do you know who I blame? Etienne Leopold Trouvelot. 150 years ago, there wasn't a single gypsy moth in North America, not one. But it only took a single man and an unfortunate accident to change all that forever. Just the sight of them can make your skin crawl. They're gypsy moth caterpillars, and they're chomping through tree foliage in forest backyards. I jumped off my bike, I was covered from head to toe. Even on college campuses. Gypsy moth caterpillars show up in late April, about the time that oak trees start to bud out. They can decimate trees and foliage. And in some areas of the country, their slimy droppings coat roofs, decks, and sheds. It's a mess. One that really started back in the 1860s, with the blowback from the pursuit of another smooth substance, silk. Silk was a hot commodity in the 19th century. The aristocracy of Europe couldn't get enough of it. And so silkworms were in high demand. With silkworms, if you reeled the silk and wove the silk and sold the silk, uh, you would have uh, literally a, a, a gold mine because silk was so valuable. This guy knows all about unintended consequences, by the way. My name is Edward Tenner. I'm a historian of technology. I study unintended consequences. And since more than 50% of reality consists of unintended consequences, I have a lot of work to do. Tenner wrote a book called Why Things Bite Back. And the story of the gypsy moth is a good example of why they do. One of the big fads in America in the 19th century was the search for an American silk industry. People believed that the Republic should not be spending all this money importing silk from Europe and from China. We really should be cultivating it here. After a great silkworm plague, Yes, that was a thing. Ravaged Europe in the mid-1800s. The search for a silkworm alternative in America heated up. Some of the nation's greatest minds took up the potentially lucrative challenge. Etienne Leopold Trouvelot was a, a French uh, astronomer who became a political exile. And if Trouvelot had not become infamous as the man who in introduced the gypsy moth, he would be really famous as an astronomer. And Trouvelot was mostly an astronomer and a World's Fair caliber artist. But he had a sideline that proved uh, fateful for the American forest. He was experimenting with uh, organisms that could replace the silkworm. Trouvelot had a million caterpillars of various species feeding behind his house in Medford, Massachusetts. To keep them contained, his property was encircled by an eight-foot wooden fence and covered by netting. It was hard work raising caterpillars. They required constant feedings. Their platforms had to be swept three times a day. Birds had to be constantly fought off. But Trouvelot continued his quest for the next silkworm. Trouvelot believed that the gypsy moth might be a good candidate, even though it was already recognized in Europe as something of a pest. Truvelo started raising gypsy moth caterpillars in 1868, but even their best silk was coarse and ragged. It was disappointing, but a severe windstorm made things much worse. The storm knocked over some of Truvelo's netting and cages, scattering gypsy moth eggs into the countryside. There were some moths that, uh, that escaped and 
there was a growing uh, road traffic. This was before the automobile, but America had had an awful lot of road traffic before automobiles. Americans were taking many more trips in the horse and buggy days, too. And these wagons, especially in the suburbs of Boston, were carrying the, uh, these moths all around New England. From buggies to trolley cars to trains and automobiles, gypsy moth eggs spread across the nation as Americans themselves grew more mobile. It proved impossible to eradicate them. The problem was recognized, but it was really too late. And so the, uh, the spread just continued decade after decade. And the caterpillars still blaze a destructive path today. This is Denise Dodd. She's a database manager for the Gypsy Moth Slow the Spread program. They are defoliators of oak and hardwood forests. Uh, the caterpillars, if they are in a high enough population density, will actually eat all of the leaves off of a tree. Since 1970, the Gypsy Moth has defoliated more than 80 million acres in the United States. Not at all what Truvolo or anyone else intended but it's a consequence millions live with today. Up next, how bad are the kudzu and gypsy moth epidemics really? And what can we learn from them? We also talked to a researcher who believes that one of kudzu's greatest unintended consequences might still be yet to come. Enjoying this episode? Check out the Great Courses Plus streaming service. It's an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects. In researching this episode of Flashback, I dove deep into the lectures, Understanding Cultural and Human Geography, and Anthropology and the Study of Humanity. With the Great Courses Plus app, we can keep our minds active, escape into this vast world of information, watch or listen at any time, anywhere. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. Kudzu has become the bad boy of invasive plant species, the one that makes local news stories and inspires poetry. Back in 1998, Congress officially listed the vine as a noxious weed, and it is still illegal to plant in some states. But how pervasive is kudzu really? It's a funny thing. Vines in the South all grow very fast, and that's an important context. That's our kudzu expert, Bill Finch again. The rate of growth of kudzu is nothing compared to the rate of growth of a lot of other vines. Asian wisteria probably is is as big a problem, if not a much bigger problem, than kudzu itself. For a long time, says Finch, scientists in the media claim that kudzu might cover as many as 9 million acres of the southeastern United States. But more recent research by the U.S. Forest Service finds otherwise. And it wasn't 9 million acres. It wasn't 8 million acres. It wasn't 7 million acres. Turns out, when they actually did an inventory, out of 200 million acres of forest land in the southeast, kudzu only covered a little more than 200,000 acres. That's less than one-tenth of one percent of the forest land in the southeast. So why does kudzu feel so much worse than it is? Finch claims that kudzu is not so much the king of the forest, but of the roadside. And that is why so many Southerners like myself, who grew up looking out a car window, became so enamored by and concerned with the vine. We began spending all of our lives driving along roadsides. It was how we understood the landscape. It was how most of us were exposed to the landscape, was was framed in our car windows. And so kudzu seemed like a much bigger threat uh, than it actually was. In other words, kudzu was not the vine that ate the South. It was the vine that ate the part of the South that we could see. Still, the Dust Bowl era decision to plant kudzu, the so-called miracle vine, in massive numbers, continues to impact us in other ways today. 
But here's the other problem with kudzu. There's a thing called the kudzu bug. Have you seen these? They're creepy, crawly, downright annoying, and some folks in the upstate say they are overwhelmed by kudzu bugs. Kudzu bugs look like dark brown beetles with a round shell, like stink bugs. They're harmless to people, but they travel in large packs. Travis Graham says when he walked out of his house Monday, kudzu bugs swarmed him. The entire house is covered. Everything that's white, you know, of our white siding, the doors, windows, they're covered. They're going inside the windows. Graham spray kudzu bugs also come from Asia, but far more recently. It's believed they arrived not at the World's Fair, but via the Atlanta airport about a decade ago, without a ticket or any bags. But they are already overstaying their welcome. While kudzu bugs help keep kudzu in check, they also like to eat soybeans, which could have some serious consequences in the future for soybean farmers across the South. Speaking of creepy bugs, the gypsy moth caterpillar also promises to be a problem in the future as it continues to colonize North America. Denise Dodd again. It's currently moving uh, south and west. Uh, there are parts of Canada that the winters are just too cold for it to survive. Uh, likewise, it will, uh, we think, reach a point in the south, you know, somewhere in Georgia, Florida, where the summers are just too hot. And that will also uh, affect survival. Programs like Dodds have indeed slowed that spread and helped manage caterpillar outbreaks. But the best way of slowing the gypsy moth might be a natural predator, a fungus known as the caterpillar killer. Almost the entire trunk of this tree from bottom to top is covered with thousands of now dead gypsy moth caterpillars. The fungus created by the May rains killed them as they entered adulthood. The spores of this fungus, also a native of Japan, use the gypsy moth larvae to reproduce, killing the larvae in the process. But as with the kudzu bug, the long-term consequences of the spread of this caterpillar-killing fungus are unknown. And that's really the moral of the story when it comes to kudzu, gypsy moths, or countless other plant and insect species. When you introduce them into a new setting, you don't know what is going to happen. And in some cases, it might be the exact opposite of what you expect. Edward Tinner calls this species of unintended consequence a revenge effect. A revenge effect is something that isn't just the price of something, it, it cancels out your, your reasons for introducing it or for using it. And that's what distinguishes a revenge effect from a trade-off or side effect. And when it comes to the introduction of species to new environments, sometimes that species will thrive in new conditions. Sometimes it will backfire and become a monumental pest, like kudzu or gypsy moths. It can be hard to tell. Biological science has no good way to predict how these things happen. It's, it's very good at explaining after the fact why they happened, but it is not so good yet in predicting just what's going to be dangerous and what's going to be harmless or beneficial. So what should we do? Maybe the lesson there is that whenever there's a question of introducing any new organism, it has to be done under extremely strict controls, and the experiment has to last longer than most people would like. Nancy Lowenstein agrees. Essentially, we just need to be wary of quick fixes and silver bullets. They rarely work out like we think they will. We now use risk assessments to evaluate the potential for invasiveness of new plants, but um, it's still an imperfect process, and it's really difficult to predict how a new species will grow in a new environment. And what should we tell enterprising amateur ecologists like Etienne Leopold Trouvelot? Denise Dodd has some advice. Oh, I don't know. Maybe a nice try, but you should stick with astronomy. And I, I think that one uh, ended up doing a little bit less damage to the forest. It can be easy to get hung up on the negative effects of something as invasive as kudzu. But the vine actually has a number of other uses and some surprising benefits. For one thing, kudzu leaves can be eaten like spinach, cooked or raw, in quiches and in salads. If you cook with kudzu though, just be sure you choose only the smallest, most tender leaves that are free of discolorations and critter bites. Ancient Chinese medicine has also long used the kudzu root to relieve hangovers, upset stomachs, headaches, and flu symptoms. And modern researchers are learning about some further potential benefits. 
Researchers at UAB have uncovered new medical benefits from kudzu, the fast-growing vine that covers many southern hillsides. New research suggests that kudzu might help lower cholesterol, blood pressure, and insulin levels, which could be beneficial for fighting a number of conditions. The root of kudzu may help patients suffering from metabolic syndrome, a cluster of conditions that increase your risk for heart disease and diabetes. The kudzu root has also been shown to help alcoholics lower their consumption of alcohol. And that's not all. Which brings us back to our organic farmer and researcher, Susanna Valente. Thanks to her husband's suggestion, she started to study the kudzu root to see if it could help with any of the antiretroviral therapies being developed to treat HIV. And much to the surprise of Valente and her colleagues in the lab, it did. So for a kudzu, we found that it was preventing a, a step that is actually not even targeted by other uh, compounds in clinical use, which is attachment. In other words, the kudzu helped prevent the HIV virus from attaching to the human cell's surface and beginning its harmful process of replication. Finally, a surface that all of us can rejoice in kudzu swallowing up, the outside of an HIV virus. Valente and her colleagues have not been able to isolate the particular compound in kudzu responsible for the inhibiting effects, but she sees great potential in discovering, or rediscovering, some of the beneficial effects of natural compounds like the kudzu root. They have immense power, and they are original compounds and have very interesting structures. And uh, there's, I think definitely we should, there should be more uh, interaction between classic academics and some of these um, less classic medicine, like Chinese medicine or, or tribal medicine in Africa or in other parts of the world. What did we learn from our tangled vine of history today? One, not everything you see at a World's Fair is a groundbreaking effort in human progress. Two, it's possible to treat one calamity like the Dust Bowl by introducing another. So be careful you don't make the problem worse with your solution. Three, there's more to the world around us than what you can see out your car window. Four, a lot of things from kudzu to fungi to anime seem to work far better in Japan than they do elsewhere. Five, kudzu is useful for treating everything from alcoholism to HIV. And finally, if your backyard is overrun with something creepy and crawly and disgusting, it might not be an act of God so much as the act of some misguided man decades ago. Flashback is written and hosted by me, Sean Braswell, senior writer and executive producer at Ozzy. It was produced by Robert Kulos, Tracy Moran, Iorio de Gizua, and Shannon Williamson. Chris Hoff engineered our show. Special thanks to the crew at iHeartRadio Podcast Networks, especially Sophie Lichterman and Jack O'Brien. Make sure to subscribe to Flashback on the iHeartRadio app or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Flashback is the latest podcast from Ozzy, a modern media company producing original TV series, festivals, news, and podcasts for curious people. Ozzy's unique storytelling focuses on the new and the next, whether that's forward-looking news and features, bold new perspectives on TV, or brand new ways of looking at history. What is that sound that you hear? That's the sound of pest control. Looking for an all-natural and effective way for getting rid of the kudzu on your property? There's a new method that's all the rage where I live in North Carolina. There are some new contract employees for the city of Winston-Salem. They're efficient, they're hardworking, and they're pretty cute. Do you know who these employees are? The city is experimenting with goat scaping for the first time. City officials hired a herd of about 30 goats to go in and help clear a plot of land near the Dixie Classic Fairgrounds that had been overrun with kudzu. Officials say the goats are quicker and cheaper than your standard methods, and they are better equipped to navigate the plot of land. Apparently, it's also good for the goats. And the goat keepers say the goats are just fine with their new job. Kudzu very healthy for them because it contains a lot of protein. Looks like they're hard workers, too. And they don't complain. <laughs> Short lunch hours, back to work. <laughs> To dive deeper, head to ozzy.com slash flashback. 
That's ozy.com slash flashback. There you can find my other lecture notes from today's episode, featuring extended interviews, links to further reading, and more information on the invasive history of kudzu and gypsy moths, as well as links to other hidden stories from history, uncovered by me and reporters at Ozzy. We all need a break from the constant cycle to learn something new, to gain new perspectives. The Great Courses Plus streaming service is an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects or pick up a new hobby. I've been enjoying the Great Courses Plus while researching this season of Flashback. Lectures like Play Ball, The Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime, History of the Supreme Court, and Battlefield Europe have helped me connect the dots on several stories from history. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ozzy. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ozzy.